Hello. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Okay. So, uh, how was your, uh, I haven't seen you in a couple weeks. Uh, how have you been? Uh, that was good. Uh, I, um, I've written a project. I basically, I got a result and currently I'm trying to, like, optimize genetic factors. And probably make them rather than more complicated. <laughs> yeah. Is that like uh is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> I don't know. Um so basically I um in Retina there is only one kind of interneuron, I mean in reality. So um to simulate like the developing um process I just um throw out as various different kind of interneurons and basically the results being like two types of interneurons and a lot of connections, especially skip connections. Um, so that's a little bit different from the real retina. But yeah, so currently I'm trying to make the retina more complicated so as to see if there's any more interesting thing to explore. So it was intentional to make it more complicated, or... <laughs> okay. Well, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I was wondering how that was going. I imagine that it was uh, pretty successful. I mean, you know, some success... You are finding some success in it. Uh, so, good. Um, anything else going on? Uh, nope. That's probably all. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I guess your finals are coming up pretty soon, so. Yeah. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, Jesse said he might be in the meeting momentarily, so, and Kit said he couldn't be here, so we'll see who comes. Mm. Uh, let's see. I have the paper. Oh, why don't we go through that again? Uh, yeah. Let's see, I'll present my screen. And uh, I can send you a link in case you don't have it. So this is the paper. Uh, still, there, you know, if the title is not to anyone's liking, they're willing to. They they're welcome to suggest changes. That's just kind of the stand-in one. Uh, still need to write the abstract, uh, but that's, I guess, that's kind of like uh, something you do later in the process. Uh, introduction, motivation. Let's see what has been added here since we last. In this area, I like, fleshed out some of the neurodevelopment brain networks uh, conversation. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with... Uh, is this where I put it? It may be. I don't know if you're familiar with like developmental connectionism. No. I, I, I could have heard of this word. But... Oh, okay. Well, I mean, connectionism is, of course, the you know, uh, like neural networks. They used to call neural networks connectionism kind of, uh, you know, early when they were doing work in this area. But um, that develop it was developmental connectionism was a series of papers that people, I think uh, one of the original publishers of the uh, connectionism papers published. Uh, and they were basically trying to, they were trying to solve that problem so, as you know, they had uh, they had a number of ways that they went about doing it, and uh, that but it never really went anywhere. So, I cited some of those papers in here, mm -hmm. uh, and they're in the bibliography. Uh, let's see, the, the yeah, this development and connectionism section, which is the part that has. Uh, so they basically created these models, they're connectionist models, so they're like neural networks. And they wanted to 
build these models to define developmental trajectories, critical periods, and what they call ontogenetic learning. So ontogeny is, of course, another word for development, but they use it more in behavior to talk about, you know, changes that are, occur due to development. So uh, then I've been talking with Jesse about some of the other, other things that we might put in here. He was talking about embodied cognition and uh you know we'll we'll need like some references there uh and you know because the embodiment uh, literature is really uh you know they have like seven different definitions of embodiment so it's like if you're looking at embodied robots or embodied uh, humans or embodied uh something else there there are like seven different definitions and they all kind of are similar but they're not exactly the same so I warned them about this about getting into that literature <laughs> you have to really know what you you have to really define what you're talking about like here are the papers we're going to talk about and so uh, let's see yeah, and then uh, some work or some other contributions on feedback and the every good regulator theorem uh, which he wants to, to add in here have you ever heard of the every good regulator theorem sorry have you heard of the every good regulator theorem yes i think jesse talked about it like um during cell meetings yeah yeah mm. so yeah that's uh which is interesting it has a lot of uh like, you know, it's, it has a lot of relevance to a lot of the stuff that people talk about, like in neuroscience and, you know, about like regulation and feedback. Uh, but, you know, people really haven't talked about it using that language. So, uh, well, we'll probably talk about it here. So <laughs> it might solve that problem a bit. Um, let's see. So this, these are your methods here. Again, uh, and then we have our software and instantiations part here. So that's your contribution. I'm still waiting on Stefan and uh, waiting on uh, Ankit, who's busy until the end of the month. Then, uh, let's see. This is a note for Ankit. Uh, and then... Uh, then I've added a little bit to the discussion, so we're kind of like fleshing out the discussion now, too. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. I added a note here. Uh, oh, this is provide an overview of things yet to be done, how software can be improved. So we've kind of got that for you. If you, if you have any other things you think of, you know, you can add them in. Um, yeah, otherwise, sure. I'll, I can flesh that out a bit too. Mm -hmm. I uh, think about Yeah, because I mean, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, we'll have other people. I'm going to kind of put everyone's, uh, I'm going to try to put everyone's thing in the same section and just refer to the different mm -hmm. uh, sections and say this is what needs to be done. But, uh, and then the discussion. Then okay, so then we had use cases, and so you added this in uh, the hinge connecting behavioral and neural models. So can you uh, talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, I'm thinking about like because um, we are using Bloomberg vehicle, and you know Bloomberg vehicle has some sort of that that sort of brain, and also you can visualize Bloomberg vehicle, um, say in terms of its traje trajectories. Or um, like Ankit's, um, like Ankit's implementation um, to that sort of visualizations. So, um, so, so I think Bloomberg Repo is a very good um, connection between the behaviors, behavior model and neural models. So basically, we can say um, encode a neural model, say encode a connection that, say, mathematician has already built into the brain vehicle and also you um, add some sort of uh, decision tree or something in your matter brain vehicle to run in environments um, or 
do any other sort of visualization of the behaviors of the brain vehicle and try to like fit the behaviors of the brain vehicle into a uh, behavior model. So I don't know if that's clear. Um, yeah. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of animal behaviors, um, a lot of people just use level flights to model animals' behaviors. So that's basically a um, very statistical approach. Um, for those that decide the behaviors of the animals, there are, uh, for example, the uh, network modeling of uh, the motor system of the, um, I don't know, the brain. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I guess. Uh, so why do you say? Why do you use the word hinge? I'm curious. I don't know. <laughs> uh, oh, just like coming up with a good. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's fine. I think yeah we could probably, uh, you know, I, I might define what hinge. The hinge is just a way to say you're connecting the two. I, I mm -hmm. like the idea though. It's actually a good term. Uh, Yes, yeah, so, I mean that's a that's a thing that's. I think I added some references in, in the introduction. Yeah. The talk about like the connection between behavioral modeling and neural modeling. So there's yeah. a you know a fair amount of work on that area, but it's a it's a contentious debate. So it's like, well, how do you uh, you know how do you make this salient? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about, thinking about like if we can use the brain vehicle and um, uh, the idea that we use that we used in our implementations to make a connection between, um, for example, the migration or um, the, the the trajectory of searching food or um, avoiding predators and prey, and let it connect it with, say, the um, models of sensory systems or the models of motor systems or um, emotion and uh, cognition and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that's good. Um, also, I think like there's a lot of, uh, like, I don't know if you've ever heard of the internal model, which people use in motor control. So the internal model actually goes back to uh, cyber, like early cyberneticists, uh, actually back to the EGRT, where they talk about, you know, you have this internal model, which is like, you know, you, it might be a black box, it might be like a detailed model, but it's in, in your head, mm -hmm. and you're predicting things that happen in the environment. So, you know, if you have like a, uh, they have a thing in computer science called the pull balancing problem, that people are always trying to solve you know, like as a benchmark for uh, algorithms. And mm -hmm. you can, you know, the internal model, you can kind of calibrate that based on something like that, uh, where you have a motor system that, you know, has like that, the sim very simple degrees of freedom, and you're trying to predict, you know, how to keep the pole balanced. So if it uh, leans too far in one direction, you make a correction. If it leans too far in the other, you make a correction. And yes. so that's just a very easy linear uh, correction to make, and that's the internal model. Then, you know, in the human brain, of course, in the cerebellum, you have maybe something a little bit more complex than that. But, like, there are other places where, you know, you could have that. So, for example, uh, you know, modeling simple behaviors like, you know, uh, you know integrating senses or... Uh, search behaviors there are a lot of ways you could use that so but i like the idea of having like this connection between the two uh the two you know between modeling the brain modeling behavior but i i think that whole debate you know could be helped if we made we had simpler uh, examples of you know that connection because i think people are thinking well you know the brain's pretty complex and behavior is pretty complex so uh, therefore, you know, we have to overthink this <laughs> and say, you know, it's a huge debate and we don't really know how to do it, but it's it's really, 
yeah, like maybe we should start with something like this. So, yeah, maybe we'll, uh, I'll add a little bit to this. Uh, well, actually, I think in the next part, I kind of summarize, because we have the use cases section, and then the follow-up on some of the concepts. So, I think that part will be like, you know, where we can put something like that. Mm -hmm. But we also have other use cases, so uh, if, if you if you want to refine this part, you're welcome to. Uh, it looks pretty good now. Uh, the possible impl implementation, that's, you know, yeah, we can work that out a little bit. But I think, like, maybe we'll put the implementations, well, I guess we can put it there. Because we'll have, like, uh, another couple other use cases, and we'll kind of, you know, I talk about the implementations. By that, I just mean, I guess, experimental uh, methods one could use. Like, if you really want to show the power of this use case, then the implementation, like if I set up a ex simple experiment and say, you know, if I have a bunch of, or maybe like one Brightenburg vehicle and maybe like a, an array of sensory objects, uh, could I run this experiment and demonstrate, you know, how this, how this works? Um, like, in, and so for each use case, it's going to be a bit different, but I think it, it gives you a range of, uh, it gives people a range of sort of, uh, ideas of how this works. So then, yeah, the, the follow-up on some of the concepts is in this section. Um... <coughs> Then we have the references. So there's some pretty good references in here. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see if I can find the one that I was talking about. Uh, okay, so I think this uh, connection is models of development. So McLawland was one of the people who originally published on connectionism. And so they also did this paper on developmental connectionism. Uh, then they're like constructivist type models, which are, uh, you know, not really connectionism, but it's applying like things from robotics and developmental psychology. Uh, yeah, so there are a couple papers there. Let's see. Yeah. Um, actually, this one, I don't know if I showed this paper before, made it into my other group. Anthony Zador, who's a computational neuroscientist, he yeah. published this paper this year on peer learning and innate, innateness in the brain. So that's the other thing, too, is that there's a another debate about, you know, how innate do you need to make an artificial system? I think you've shared, shared it like, uh, in a very early period of the development time. I think it's May or, yeah. Yeah. So, um, this, yeah, so the idea is, yeah, the idea is that you, you how innate do you need to make things? And, and the other people are arguing about this too. Like, you know, if you just use statistics, like in machine learning where you're using statistical learning, you're just taking like a, let's just, least be cynical and say it's a, a regression model and you're mm -hmm. throwing a bunch of data at it and it's uh, making cl a classification and that's like te technically what the brain does in, in a lot of ways uh, but it's of course there's more to it than that but you know people will do that and then say well it's very intelligent it's be able to classify my examples very well and that's good uh, but of course if you give it more complex tasks like, you know, how to pick up a cup of coffee, it might do a little bit better on that, or a little bit worse. Uh, if you give it a really hard problem, like asking it what it is, you know, something really meta like that, it's going to fail. And so, then the question is, if you put in, like, uh, representations, like base representations, can you get better a better result? Um, so that's a very old idea, actually. A lot of the like classic AI, that's what they used to do. They used to actually just build representations and then take the robot out into the world and 
And actually, years ago, I guess the argument was the opposite, where they said, well, if you build these representations, you're making the systems too brittle. If you take them out into nature, they won't be able to generalize things because you're basically having to define every object that they encounter. So, you know, uh, you might build a robot with a very, uh, you know, very complicated symbolic system where they map many different things in the environment to symbols and then manipulate the symbols. But then, you know, you need real data. That was the argument that if you go into the real world, you encounter a lot of things you can't really predict in advance. So the representational systems are brittle. But now, of course, people are building very large scale data funnels that basically take a lot of data in but don't have very much representation. So now people are making the other argument. Well, you know, uh, you need to have representations because how do you, you know, uh, what happens when you classify something wrong or the computer makes a mistake, a very fundamental mistake about like human nature or about the world. And then you, if you have like a, a self-driving car, that's actually pretty catastrophic because you could hit obstacles or whatever. So, you know, it's worth keeping that in mind in terms of balancing uh, these kind of systems. And, you know, obviously the, the uh, trick is going to be to get the balance right. Um, mm -hmm. So I just, just wanted to get into that just to <laughs> kind of give my thoughts on that. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that there's, that uh, looks pretty good. I think we're coming along on this. And then you added a couple of references for the case. Okay. case. The reference is that like, like an overview of those neural models and uh, the behavior models. Yeah, yeah, mathematical neuroscience. That's a good one. Um, and then uh, statistical modeling of individual animal movement. I'll have to look at that actually. I haven't like uh, seen that paper, but that looks pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, so actually, I think it was actually someone I'm collaborating with in another meeting, and we were talking about uh, like modeling of uh, ant swarms or ant colonies. And um, we were talking about some of, like, the rules for foraging and things like that. Um, and, yeah, we were talking about, like, there's a whole optimal foraging literature. And what's interesting about ants, and I think I mentioned this in one of the presentations, is that, like, people are really interested in the emergence aspect of ant behavior. So how do you get a bunch of ants to do something collectively? But there are all these literatures on, like, uh, optimal foraging and on, like, you know, uh, cognition, and they're really not very well integrated into the emergence literature. So, like, when you go in there, you kind of see that. Like, <laughs> it's like a lot of physicists are interested in emergence, say, and then the biologists are interested in, like, foraging and behavior and some emergence, but it's, like, disconnected. So it's, it's just interesting. So I'll have to look at that paper. So is there anything else you can think of that we need to address in the paper or? Uh, I don't think so, but um, I don't know, because I have more equations for my model. Okay. Uh, like the, the equations for those uh, uh, olfaction and uh, bidirectional memory. So I don't know if it is necessary to add those equations, because I, I think that is subject to uh, the journal we are going to submit to it. Yeah, well, yeah, I think... Uh, yeah, some journals do not really need that much equations, they just like the ideas. But some journals may need more equations and something like that. Yeah. How many more equations are you talking like, Um, For, um, I think, uh, two for um, the Lee Hockfield Network, okay. and two for um, the uh, bidirectional associative memory. Okay. Well, yeah, why don't we add them in? Uh, I mean, we can okay. always take them out later if they want them taken out. Yeah, sure. uh, oh, yeah. Going for the preference calculation. Yeah, yeah. And I think a good way to typeset them is, uh, so I just 
like when you created a when you wrote them in LaTeX in a, a markdown file in your uh, a GitHub repo mm -hmm. for like this this equation. I just I have an uh, an extension on Chrome that reads that as like a, this renders it like this, and then I just copied and pasted it into this uh, document. So like if you, I found that yeah if you uh, write stuff in LaTeX and Markdown and on uh, GitHub mm -hmm. and you get the, the this uh, extension it actually handles the equations pretty well, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can like just transfer them into a Google Doc. Yeah, yeah. So it just yeah, just when you want to put those in, just let me know. Like put them in a markdown file, maybe in the same file, and then mm -hmm. draw my attention to them. Or you can put them in. Well, I'll, I can put them in, but yeah, just let me know. It's always good to put them in, and sometimes they have them in like an appendix or like a. I think for like frontiers, they put a lot of that sort of stuff in like a supplemental file. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, so I mean, it's but it's always good for people to have in case they need it. Um, okay. I'll probably yeah, I've been busy with other papers and stuff so I like have been working on this sporadically so mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn back to it a little bit more now though. Uh, I had a, another paper I was working on uh, it's really interesting we're doing deep learning and image processing and I had a I was the one who's gonna bring all this stuff together <laughs> like into a single paper and then uh -huh. uh, so, I mean, that, that was a lot of work. And then, you know, getting everything coordinated. Um, so it's almost done. So then I'll be turning my attention to this um, more. Although I've been working on it, like, you know. So um, I think that's it for the paper. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, do you have anything else you wanted to talk about? or? Uh, nope. Not right now. As I'm hoping that uh, Stefan would come in and uh, talk about his, he went to a, uh, a brain hack event last mm -hmm. week. So, He's like a or something. Yeah, yeah. Those are always kind of cool. I mean, the. Okay. Are you familiar with brain machine interfaces? Have you worked at all with them? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Actually, Actually um, when, when I was in high school, school I, I, I applied, applied for, for a couple of. of um, the uh, 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 medical uh, engineering major um, at some, some other schools. schools. I, I was interested in those brain PCIs. PCI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, and actually, if there's, there's a chance, chance that I, I would go out to, you know, know uh, touch it here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting field. I, see, they're, they're making you know, advances in terms of, like, the telemetry and the decoding of this uh, information. Uh, it's, like, a lot of real-time processing. So it's, like, some of it that's pretty, like, hardcore signal processing. But then there's also a lot of, like, neuroscience to be done, like, in terms of, you know, understanding, like, you know, the diversity. So, like, uh, they find that, like, you can't just put a interface on someone and expect it to work perfectly there's a lot of variation across people sometimes like uh like maybe 70 percent of the population is okay with like some um aspect of the feedback and then like 30 percent have trouble adapting to the interface uh yeah something to do with like the way the neural code is generated or something we don't really understand any of that so it's like uh, there are a lot of open questions, I think, in that area. 
I don't know how much of it requires you to actually get a, you know, a, access to a brain. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you could do like, a, it, you know, there's open data and you can mine open data and ask questions that way. Um, yeah, I think there are some teams that have hit and see you that doing that sort of stuff. But um, I actually I have um, uh, trying to contact those teams to see if I can just get in touch with those. Um, naturally, they, they just say that they do not, and uh, they do not accept autographs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're basically in like neurosurgery departments or uh, uh, some other sort of like engineering school. Yeah, yeah, it's usually a little mm -hmm. bit more difficult to work on teams like that. Um, they yeah, like they're a lot all of mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing like ecology. Yeah. The cortical um, signals instead of the, you know, the skin. Oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah, they do. Well, they have the. They have EEG you can measure using a cap, and then they have EEG that's intracranial. So it's like intracranial is where they mm -hmm. put electrodes in the... So you're able to get different things, like the mm -hmm. caps you can get, like, uh, you know, like motor cortex and visual cortex and some of the parietal areas and, and attentional areas in the front. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, I mean, that's good for, like, um, you know, if you're looking at, like, basic cognitive questions like if you want to know how attention is regulated or you know uh, something to do like they use it in actually they have a lot of real-time systems where they you know they're wearable uh in like um you know work contexts like for pilots who uh they, you know they want to monitor their because apparently when you're in in a, in a plane in a fighter plane say and you accelerate you're accelerating at such a speed that there's a chance that you can be knocked unconscious or uh, your vision can be impaired by blood flow, like going into the occipital lobe uh, region and like, you know, being a problem. So, I mean, you know, you're experiencing these vast degrees of acceleration. So they actually have monitoring systems where they can wear them and they're real time so they can monitor if there's a problem. And, yeah, so they have a lot of systems like that uh, for, like, you know, for pilots, for drivers, for other, you know, things where you're out in the field and you don't have, like, you know, and but they're really doing a lot of stuff that's very basic. Like, they're looking at, like, you know, they might be looking at surface EEG components or they're, they have uh, optical systems that measure, um, it's kind of like hemodynamic activity, but it's uh, a lot more, a lot cruder than fMRI. Um, hmm. so they have ways to do that and those aren't as, um, like accurate, but they do the job that they're supposed to do. So I don't know. <laughs> there's just, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity just, you know, cause you can, uh, set up a system, uh, with a, like an EEG cap and a video game and you can look at the role of feedback and things like that. So it's not all like in neurosurgery, although... I think that's where the coolest advances are being made is in the neurosurgery area. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, oh, you were mm -hmm. gonna say something? No, no, no. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so I guess Jesse isn't gonna make it either. He said he might be able to. He sent mm -hmm. me a message, long message, so I have to go through and answer some of the things we were gonna, I was gonna show him some resources but if he shows up i don't know if he's going to show up yet but i, I can i can send those to him on slack so mm -hmm. okay z uh, well thanks for meeting thank you and i hope your term you know your your final parts of your term go well it sounds like you're going to be busy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, actually i am thinking about like after finishing the prints and genetic algorithm projects. I mean, there's a new professor at Pitt who is doing like making models. Um, I don't know what sort of model, but making models from neural images using computer vision and machine learning. Um, so I think 
I've heard that he's doing this recurrence in the network. I don't know what exactly he's doing. Yeah. I, I'm just doing that. Which is cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think there was one, I, I saw a presentation on that where they were doing it from fMRI, like they were uh, decoding like images, like they were doing fMRI, I think in the visual region, and they were getting like decoding the signal somehow and getting like images that were like the original images, but they were really distorted, of course. But yeah, I mean, that's that sounds really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah. Well, thanks for meeting. If you uh, have any... Next week? Yeah, we'll, we'll meet next week. Um, okay. So, okay. Well, have a good week. Thanks, thanks. you too. All right, talk to you later. Yeah. Bye. Okay, um, so continue the meeting uh, recording. Uh, let me actually go through some of the references that I was going to show Jesse. If Jesse's watching, you can follow along here. Um, so let's see. Uh, first thing I wanted to show was we were talking about the um, – we're preparing this paper. It involves the Evergood Regulator Theorem, and the paper is available on um, – on Figshare, and uh, I don't have a link to it. I was looking for a link. But anyways, we have this. Uh, I, what I basically did, and I wanted, to, I wanted to do this just as a survey exercise. Let me actually share my screen. So here, here we are. Uh, I couldn't find a link, uh, but it's on Figshare. Um, and it, but I, I've been wanting to do this for a while. I wanted to see if how this paper fits into the literature because cybernetics literature has evolved in over the course of time, and it's good to see where your paper fits in. So I have this this. Uh, resource that I learned about in the eWife Ambassadors program. It's called Jane. And if we go to this reference here, it's an application that if you have some text from your paper, you can plug it into this engine and it will find like things in the literature. So if you have a block of text, it could be the whole paper, it could be like the abstract, the title, uh, I think there's like a limit on the number of words, but you can uh, search and you can find similar journals or similar journal articles, similar authors, uh, and um, oh, okay, similar journals and similar articles. So you can search in a number of ways, and it generates this list of things. So I did this with our paper. We did the the title and the abstract, then that'll become clear when you see what I did with them. Uh, and then I got this output, which is, uh, it's a, I think a Excel file of different, like titles and words and things like that. So then what I did was I refined that list down to a series of words. So I had the, like, I searched Jane for the title or the abstract and it found articles that were similar. I believe that's how he did it. So this is, uh, my, so I made word clouds out of both of them. So the word clouds that were made here represent the first 60 articles in the Jane database. So, <coughs> so I took, say, for example, the title of the paper, and I plugged it into this Jane software, and it spit out a number of articles. And I took the first 60, and I took the most common words and created a list of those. So including only the paper titles and journal names. So I filtered the list by, you know, uh, the title and then the journal name and everything else was excluded. So I removed a bunch of characters and then made word clouds out of them. So if you're not familiar with word clouds, 
they are where you have a bunch of words and you put them into this program and they order them in, in order of relevance and the most relevant words are the largest and the least relevant words are the smallest and they're on the edge of the cloud so let me show you one example so for the title we have this uh, and this is a word cloud that is based on all the words in the that came up in the articles that came up as hits for the title so the title actually uh, I can't remember what the title is exactly but it's uh you know mentions cybernetics it mentions control it mentions like a number of words and you can see that it's actually kind of interesting the sorts of words that come up um plus comes up a little bit that's a journal title that's kind of irrelevant but that was left in the search but the big words i think are worth paying attention to so we have ieee which is an engineering uh organization uh, medical emotion so we have a lot of things that are like adaptive systems reconsidering for some reason that was in there i don't know why um because you know it's like you even if the title is reconsidering in it the search results shouldn't necessarily be reconsidering in them so it's it's not sure why that is but that's an interesting piece of information uh, we have journal capitalized and journal non capitalized. Uh, I might filter these later. I didn't, uh, I just kind of made these on the fly. If we we're gonna like publish them on a blog post or somewhere else, I'd probably refine these a bit. But, um, as you can see, uh, this is actually the reason why I did this exercise was to see what the literature around this paper looks like. And as you can see, you know, there's a lot of kind of a split between like maybe psychology and psychiatry and maybe engineering and then like models. So you have like therapy, psychotherapy, and then regulation control, IEEE, which is engineering, but also anorexia. So, I mean, it makes sense because uh, we know that um, uh, Ashby was a psych. He was a, psych a psychiatrist by training, and he was also a cyberneticist. And we also know that cybernetics is picked up by engineers and turned into control theory, but that there's also a lot of cybernetics going on in the social sciences, and it's very different from the kinds of activities that are going on in engineering. But So then I did the same thing for the uh, introduction. I think that was title. So then I did the same thing for the introduction. And this is, of course, we didn't really have a abstract to this paper. It was like kind of a essay style paper. So there was an introduction, which is a, a lot longer and includes a lot different words. The words are very different um, than the title, as it turns out. Because as we see from this word cloud, we see a little bit different organization of, of uh, keywords. <clears throat> so in this one, you get more biological stuff like uh, biophysics molecular um we have cybern which i think is like short for cybernetic i don't know why or phylos um you know i don't really know why those are there but uh but but here you have a lot less engineering and you have a lot more just like science practice so you have medicine psychology again but then you also have like uh, biophys biophysics. You have some stuff uh, from maybe from philosophy, like arg argumentative. Uh, what else? Um, we have physics, which could be anything. We have nursing. We have cultural frontiers as a journal name. But I think you get my point is that this is shifted a bit you know you see i triple e it's much smaller so you get like a, a change and that's actually interesting because we kind of named the paper and then we did an introduction which was a little bit separated from the title um and i i, I think i recommend this type of approach to people writing papers 
and they don't exactly know where they fit into the world. Like, do this kind of analysis, um, and it might clarify things for you. <clears throat> so again, this is the method uh, from using the gene database. So it's at this location. Um, it's at the Orthogonal Research Lab, uh, GitHub. It's in Cybernetics and Systems. And then you can find it under the word cloud for EGRT paper. I might actually make this more prominent in, in the repo um, after I perfect the method. But I've had this here for a couple weeks. So I did this in late September. So <clears throat> I haven't had a chance to turn back to it. But this is definitely something to follow up on. And I recommend it if you want to figure out where your paper fits in. Um, I think the gene uh, database was designed for people who wanted to kind of find like like papers and journals so that they could you know do a better job of citations and and maybe find the optimal journal. So um, that's worth checking out. Um, I also uh, I've also been involved with FQXI, not formally, but I've been sort of involved in their activities, their outreach activities. Uh, this is the, Every year they have an essay contest. Uh, so this year I think they're going to have an essay contest very soon. It's coming up um, in a, they're going to announce it imminently. They have it on their website, but they don't have the details of this year's competition. But in the past years they've had a number of really interesting competitions. Uh, what they do is they have a call for a topic and it's something to do with physics, but it's more broadly defined than that. So uh, the two I participated in was what is fundamental, which was, I think, in late 2016 or early 2017. And then wandering towards the goal, which was late 2017, or early 2018. And they didn't have one this last year. But um, so what is fundamental? It sounds like physics, but it's not entirely physics. And my answer actually wasn't entirely physics. Um, so they uh, commission these essays and, and they're like a bunch of people enter the contest and then the winners get like a prize and like published in a proceeding. But everyone's essays are available for people to evaluate. So this is my first shot at it and I turn this into a document that I'd like to work on further perhaps with Jesse, perhaps with other people if they're interested. Um, this one, I, the title is Towards the Meta Fundamental, Introducing Your Contextual Invariance. Um, I have to warn you that, like, this is my opportunity to be inscrutable, these essays. So, um, <laughs> so this was me writing this um, and just kind of having... I think this was the one from 2017, 2018, but it doesn't really matter. This was me just writing in, in isolation some of the ideas that I've had on these issues over the years. So uh, this is an abstract here. We're kind of like mixing together like, uh, you know, complex adaptive systems with, uh, you know, philosophy of science with uh, some... Uh, like cognition of science and you know cultural relativism and things like that just kind of mixing them together into this um this essay so like um and i talk about cultural practice for example uh you know interested here in cognition of science but specifically culture um so it just talks about fundamental in different ways here so uh, you know, thinking about fundamental, like when people talk about fundamental, they're usually talking about something that is like an invariant rule or like um, some property of nature that we're uncovering and people get really excited about it. And they have different words for it, like invariant or fundamental. Uh, people don't really think about the philosophy of it, though, and the, the especially like the cognition and culture that are involved in this concept. And so... Uh, this is a, a way to kind of think about that a little bit. Uh, so fundamental is cultural practice. Uh, fundamental leads to building blocks. 
Fundamental further leads to structure. Fundamental is descriptive. And then science is relevance. So this actually, um, this, oh, this was associated with a paper that I, or a preprint that I, pre I prepared on this, where it, it, there was actually a, um, an analysis of terms done on papers from two different conference proceedings. And so the, the analysis there was to take the titles and the abstracts of these uh, uh, things from the conference proceedings and analyze them in a way that was to find key words. And this was done over a number of time points. So the idea was to show how these, how relevance changes in a field over time. And so uh, this is the old NIPS conference now called NeurIPS and Gecko, which is a um, evolutionary algorithms conference. And so I took those two sets of proceedings and looked at them um, and looked at like changes in topics over time. It's really interesting. The reason I used NIPS was because there's a, over time, there's, a, there's some pretty interesting trends in, in, you know, changes in topics over time. It's really gone from being a sort of a niche computational neuroscience conference to becoming like a machine learning conference. So I wanted to see the shift in topics. And then, of course, Gecko has seen a shift in topics, but not nearly as dramatic. Um, also, I did the same thing with journal articles. So I looked at the journal Evolution and the journal Evo Devo, which are two areas of evolutionary biology, to kind of get a sense also of how Topics like Evo Devo, which is sort of an up and coming topic, versus evolution, which is more established, <clears throat> how those change over time too. Um, and then the conclusions. So the, actually, there should be a link to that paper in this. Yeah, this one here. This paper posted at Sci Archive is the outcome of that analysis. So that's interesting uh, reading. I uh, hope you check that one out and check this out as well. The other essay, so that was from 2017-2018. Wandering Towards the Goal was from 2016-2017. This was both shorter and it was sort of a conversational, sort of, wasn't like, it was my, there were my ideas, but I formed these ideas in conjunction with Dr. Richard Gordon and Robert Stone. We, we talked about a lot of things between us and like I could put a pers com by everything that we kind of shared but you know it was it was mostly my synthesis but I wanted to uh, give them some credit for their influence on it so again here this is another philosophy of science gambit with some mathematical realism thrown in um, talk, it's, it's kind of an interesting cross between talking about cognition and brainless cognition, which is where you get cognitive like behaviors without a brain. So, uh, passive dynamic walking systems are an example of this, but also, um, you know, collective structures of animal, uh, behavior or, you know, uh, cells that are doing things that resemble information processing. Um, so, I, you know, to really do this justice, you have to read the whole thing. It's, like I said, this is my opportunity to be inscrutable, but, um, you know, I kind of hope to, like, revise these maybe over time and publish them in a venue. Uh, we'll see where it might go. Um, so yeah, that's just going over that. And then I also applied to one of their grants, um, so they had a grant call this past spring, Intelligence in the Physical World. So this is, uh, I think they were looking for more physics-related projects, but I did submit this grant proposal. I don't know if I have the grant proposal here in the repo, but I have it sort of, I might put that in later, but I have the outline here of what, I needed to do for it. Uh, this isn't this this outline here isn't the 
the paper, but rather the application, I can post that now that the grant proposal is passed. Like I didn't get it, obviously, or else I'd be telling you about the great things we're doing with it. But um, I'll post that. Anyways, I just wanted to bring attention to that. It's based on this idea that I've been developing called physical intelligence, which is um, it's using a lot of the sort of brainless cognition ideas and things like uh, motor control and, you know, synthesizing that around a concept called physical intelligence. Uh, again, I'll, I'll post the uh, actual... Oh, this is it. This is the grant proposal. It's called abstract for some reason. Oh, this was a proposal abstract. So I didn't actually prepare like a eight page proposal. I prepared this summary for them and they didn't, they took a pass on it. But so this is actually, um, it's, it's the idea of having an intelligence system that's, a uh, you know, subject to a lot of the things that we talk about in, in cybernetics like uh, homeostasis and uh, feedback but also things like information and emergence and then linking that up with behaviors and simulated behaviors so we talk about using some technologies like virtual reality and a tangible user interface um so yeah i mean it's it's uh it's some work that i did years ago that was uh, maybe a little bit ahead of its time uh but it's you know interacting with like you know computing technologies and things like that and uh, you know observing plasticity of nervous systems and things like that so i know i'm kind of just babbling on about this part but you'll have to read it to really get the full impact um I'm just kind of looking at it and, and pointing interesting things out. So anyways, uh, that that's the theory of physical intelligence, biological systems. I'd like to flesh that out as well. And again, I don't know what the essay topic is for this year, but definitely uh, I will be involved in that. If anyone wants to be a co-author on that, they can join in more formally. So, uh, well, that brings us to the end of our meeting. Uh, if you uh, have anything to ask me or share with me, I know Jesse shared some things with me uh, just before the meeting, so I'll look those over and answer them. So, but if you have any other questions or issues that arise, please contact me, Slack me, email me, whatever. Okay, uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Have a good week.